Well, welcome to this special edition of North Carolina Book Watch, set at Carolina Meadows south of Chapel Hill. We're talking to authors who live there and are part of this vibrant community. Uh, I'm D.G. Martin. My guest now is uh, William Powers, author of Tar Heel Catholics, the history of Catholicism in North Carolina. We, um, you're the author of uh, three nonfiction books, I think maybe more, plus a novel. And the novel, um, Love is Strong as Death, is uh, sort of an autobiographical novel. Uh, you started out as a Catholic priest and then became a college professor along the way. You and Ann got married, and then when you retired, you came to North Carolina. Right. But you're not a North Carolinian. How did you happen to write the, the history? Uh, well, it started out by needing a topic for a sabbatical leave from where I was teaching. And the second <laughs> I wouldn't <have> factor <laughs> was that uh, my wife and I had been here several times and were thinking of retiring uh, to uh, North Carolina. And the third thing is what you suggested is since I had been a priest, I was very familiar with the Catholic Church. I wrote to the Bishop of Raleigh and I said, would you be interested in my writing a history of the church? And, North Carolina. And his uh, second-in-command guy wrote back and said, come down and we'll talk. And, and they agreed. They opened their archives to me and allowed me to interview a, a number of priests. And so I spent a year, that sabbatical year, uh, doing the research on this, on this book. By the way, when someone asked me what I was doing, I said, I'm writing the, the history of the church in North Carolina. He said, uh, well, that should take you about two weeks and produce a nice little pamphlet. Uh, I mean, the idea was <laughs> that, that there were just so few Catholics in, in North Carolina, which, of course, was true uh, early on. When a new bishop came to Raleigh in 1945, there were 15,000 Catholics in the whole state. Now there's that many in Cary. Uh, Things or have more. changed a lot. Or more. <laughs> well, you know, when you and Walter Dellinger were talking uh, a minute ago, uh, Walter mentioned that as a young Catholic kid, he had aspired, expressed an, an, a desire to his teacher to be governor of North Carolina. And uh, what it, it, it parallels with what you said in the early 19, late 50s or 1960s about uh, Catholics in North Carolina. Uh, Catholic couldn't couldn't think of being governor. Not only that, but if we go back to the 19th century, the first uh, uh, prominent Catholic was Gaston, William Gaston of New Bern. And he was very uh, much liked by the political establishment here, and he was invited to be a member of the state Supreme Court. And he said, I can't be a member of the Supreme Court. And he said, why? because Article 32 of the state constitution says only Protestants can be members of the government in North Carolina. That was in the constitution. And they said, I don't pay any attention to that. He said, I'm going to pay attention to it. Anyway, they held a constitutional convention in, 19, in 18, 1835 and Gaston argued that this religious requirement for public office should be removed because it did not exist in the national or the federal constitution. And they argued and debated it back and forth, and they finally compromised. And the constitutional change in 1835 said only Protestants, I mean, excuse me, only Christians can be uh, elected to office in North Carolina. So he qualified. Now, that restriction has been subsequently removed, and there is no religious requirement at the present time, of course. And as you point out in your book, uh, North Carolina elected a Catholic governor uh, about the time you wrote the book, and no, no, almost no discussion, almost no one took note of it. Well, I suppose after President Kennedy, it would be difficult to object to a Catholic in, in public office. But I, one of the things I've done is I've written a number of op-ed page pieces for the News and Observer. One of them, some years back, 
was about the fact that in North Carolina at that time, the, the governor was a Catholic, Mike Krzyzewski, the, the big deal coach uh, at Duke was a Catholic, and Molly Broad, the president of the uh, North Carolina University system, were all Catholics. But I said, here were three of the major institutions of the state headed by Catholics, and, and nobody even knew that. Or, nobody knew. Or, why, or what, what changed? Or, and why? Part in, of in it, a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part of it is that the, the general climate of the, of the country has changed. And I think another part is that so many of us have come from the North where the, there isn't that tradition of anti-Catholicism that there was here in the South for the longest time. So in other words, establishing a Catholic presence here was, I think, parallel to the situation with the African Americans. You know, that there was just deep-seated suspicion or hatred or distrust or uh, uncertainty about Catholics. And uh, it took a long time to overcome Is that. Is it over now? I suppose there's a residual anti-Catholicism, but I, d I don't really think it's, uh, it's much of an issue. Thank you for writing this book and for sharing just a little bit of it. There's much more in that book that is of interest not just to Catholics, but to anybody who cares about North Carolina. Thank you.